All right, good evening, everybody. This is the curriculum workshop of the Downers Grove Grade School District 58 Board of Education here on Monday, October the 23rd, 2023 at 7 p.m. here at Downers Grove Village Hall. This meeting is being live streamed for the public on the Village of Downers Grove's YouTube channel. Melissa, will you please call roll? Member Doshi. Here. Member Ellis is absent. Member Hannes. Here. Member Harris. Here. Member Olchik. Here. Member Weiner. Here. Member Hughes. Here. Uh, tonight, members of the audience will have an opportunity to provide public comment to the board later on in the agenda. The board asks anyone wishing to comment to please fill out a card over there to my right uh, and then uh, indicate the topic to be addressed and then go ahead and place it in that basket on that table. I have a lot of 30 minutes tonight for public comment. We're going to start off tonight as we always do with our flag salute, so please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. <clears throat> I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right, tonight we're going to go ahead and start off the curriculum workshop with the proposed strategic plan for the 2023 through 2028. So first we want to welcome, for anyone, uh, welcome to the Board of Education and our public. If anyone's Excuse listening me. online, tonight is a workshop meeting, which means we will not be voting on anything, but we'll just be having discussions. Uh, the first thing up is the strategic plan for this evening. We'll be bringing that back for a um, vote for the Board of Education at the November meeting. In addition to talking about the strategic plan, this is a curriculum workshop, so uh, Liz Earhart will take us through a review of the end of the year ECRA data for 22-23 now that we have the IRR results, uh, overview of building SIP plans, information regarding the upcoming release of the Illinois Report Card on October 30th and some of their designations, and then also updates on district curricular committees. So with that, let's go ahead and jump right into the strategic plan. I want to start by giving a brief summary to the board and the public in terms of the timeline that we've been through. Um, so way back in March of 23, the board outlined five key areas of focus or goals. We had a very successful strategic plan uh, for the last five years. So the first three goals remained the same, and then we added two additional goals. In May of 23, we brought back the community for two evenings at O'Neill Middle School. Uh, we had approximately 100 people there between staff and community members and board members. And what we asked the community to do in the five goal areas, we asked them to define priorities. And we ended up with five priorities under each goal area, uh, or we call them objectives. In the summer and fall of 23, we developed teams that their focus or, or their charge was then to write action plans and then specifically for this year, what we were going to accomplish. We then shared that work with a DLT on September 11th and then again on October 9th. And so what you're seeing tonight is the results of the feedback that we received um, from the DLT when we were all said and done with the development teams uh, from this summer. Some key points to remember as we go over the strategic plan this evening, it becomes our North Star. Um, there are always a million things the school district could focus in on. What's nice about a strategic plan is it focuses us and uh, for as an administration, we know exactly what we need to do over the next five years. I also like to point out that this is a collaborative plan. That means that it was not just written by the board and the admin. We had staff participating, students gave us feedback at the middle school level, and then certainly uh, our families and community also part participated. What you're going to see is there are five priorities under each section of the strategic plan. We obviously can't do all five in one year. So what you're going to see tonight for most of these, we're tackling two or three of those priorities this school year. Sometimes like in, in goal three, we'll get to actually four of those. But then next year we'll come back and over the summer we'll develop action plans for the remaining two. And the way we decided which ones to focus in on, um, almost all the time, or what did the community rank, or what did the community rank highest in those areas? Just like we did last year, the DLT will monitor this um, quarterly and we'll go back to the DLT and we'll share with them how we're doing. And then of course we'll update the board during our board meetings. Um, a full year uh, one update will be presented to the board at our May meeting on May 9th and we'll bring Dr. Madonia back at that time who helped us facilitate. Um, hitting the ground running is important. Uh, in particular when we talk about the goal that's working on our new designs for middle school and elementary schools. We want to make sure that when we get to that point, we're ready to go right away and have all that work done. 
assistant superintendents continue to step up. I want to thank them for all the work, not only in the last strategic plan, but the work around this. Um, they are a great team to work with. They've spent a lot of time over the summer getting everything ready, and uh, not only for the new plan, but closing out the old plan. So I want to thank them all. They've done a great job. I also want to remind everybody, again, this is a five-year plan. Uh, so not everything will be accomplished in year one, but certainly we're going to make uh, <coughs> some pretty big steps this year. <coughs> For the presentation this evening, it is not a complete overview of everything that's in the plan. We have attached in board docs tonight a written report where if anyone wants to go through and see all five priorities for each goal, all the action steps, you can certainly do that. What we're going to focus in on tonight are what are those key priorities for this year that we're trying to tackle and what is our action steps around those. So this is really going to be focusing on the 2023-2024 school year or current year getting to that point. So with that then, we're going to bring up our um, assistant superintendents and they're going to go through the work around each goal area. When we get done with all this, uh, we'll have time for questions from the Board of Education or also to receive feedback. Good evening, board. Um, so our first goal was our focusing on learning goal, which is um, looking at our curriculum assessment and our instruction. So our first objective um, was that our district will set high expectations for all learners that are designed to meet their individual needs. So we'll do that by defining our high expectations, investigating structures for and opportunities to enhance intentional instructional planning, and then establishing an instructional framework that ensures that we're differentiating for all students while maintaining high expectations, which includes fle flexible grouping, enrichment, and interventions. In terms of the implementation plan, we will reconvene the curriculum council to operate um, and work through the um, objectives and action steps of this goal. In coordination with myself, um, Jessica, and James, we will be responsible for overseeing this objective and implementation plan. All right, for objective 1.2, uh, it's ensuring students' availability for learning by measuring and supporting their behavioral needs while also supporting mental health. So as a first step, we'll be looking at identifying some local data sources that will allow us to proactively support the needs of our students. We'll then uh, work to look at those data systems to ensure that as we're allocating resources and supporting students across the district, that we're doing uh, so consistently and equitably. And then we will be supporting our staff uh, with professional learning to ensure that they're prepared to address the needs of students within the building. We'll be utilizing existing committees to get this work done. It'll be embedded into their agendas. So our PBSS and attendance committee, threat assessment team, uh, differentiation and assessment, there's a number of them that will have components of this. And uh, this will be facilitated both by Liz and myself. And then our third objective for goal one is to implement a systematic review of data to inform transparent instructional decision making. So this will ensure that we are evaluating our existing systems of data collection, increase administra administrator and staff capacity in understanding district assessments and progress monitoring tools, and then reviewing our parent communication of student progress to ensure timely and consistent practices. In terms of these action steps, this is something that both the um, curriculum office and the technology office will work um, hand in hand to ensure that we are meeting the objectives. Goal two continues to really be about communication with our community and all of our stakeholders. And while there was certainly a lot of reflection on great gains in this area throughout the course of the last strategic plan, there's always more work to be done. So the first objective under goal two really focuses on ensuring access and two-way communication for all of our stakeholders in all of the ways that we need to be sure that information is available. So it's really going to be about reviewing the ways we're communicating currently and ensuring that that is providing access for everyone who needs it as well as a way for everyone who needs to be able to communicate with us to be able to do so beginning at the district office level and going all the way down to the classroom level. 
This is an area where we're going to look to a new group of people to, to in, embrace this work, and so we're going to form the Connection and Communication Council to meet regularly throughout the course of this school year. James and I will work together with that group, and that's really where a lot of the work from Goal 2 will live for the time being. The second objective in Goal 2 is similarly about communication and relationships, but really focuses on families that are either new to us or perhaps not yet part of our district. And so there's been a lot of good conversation around consistent programs to ensure that new families, whether that's a new kindergartner or a move into town, are, are welcomed from the get-go and have a lot of support throughout, especially that first year. And then also looking to families who are not yet part of the district and how we can build some preliminary connections and relationships. And finally, going out to community stakeholders who may not not have a direct affiliation or, or, or current enrollment with District 58 and ensuring that communication is still out there and transparent and clear for everyone. Again, lots of good work done in this area, but always more to review and reflect. And that's, the, that's one of those duplicate slides where it's the same group that's going to be doing the same. <laughs> uh, as Dr. Russell, uh, explained uh, in goal three we have four objectives uh, working with the financial advisory committee and going through the process they all fit together in a bit of a puzzle format uh, as we move forward from where we're at today through the referendum uh, planning and looking at resources and planning for what is after that one in the capital aspect as we complete uh, 3.1 uh, is essentially that is is completing the work uh, that was spelled out in the referendum that was passed by the community uh, and, and uh, making sure that we uh, work through those pieces and, and complete that work through uh, the upgrades to the facilities, the additions to the buildings, the um, secure vestibules, and of course the air conditioning uh, in, in the schools that, in areas that are not currently air conditioned. 3.2 is then the next step in that is, is the allocation of resources and continually looking at how are we utilizing our resources. This also gets to the future and looking at um, what our needs are down the road as we are completing that piece, uh, which will involve uh, uh, demographers' reports and review of overall facilities, uh, adjustments that may need to you know, happen down the road uh, to be uh, as efficient and effective as possible. Um, and so that is part of it's 3.2. 3.3 is ensuring that we have a balanced budget uh, and resources available uh, for all of the things and all the other strategic plans, teaching and learning, uh, as well as um, our, our planning of operations uh, and, and making sure you're following those adequate fund balance pieces and in, in district the board policy. Uh, focusing on the needs and continually with that five-year planning process that we have uh, had developed over time. 3.4 is, uh, is looking at towards the next steps. As I said, it's completing that puzzle, uh, moving off of the, from the completion of the referendum, and that is what is available going on uh, next into the next process uh, and what our capital needs because Certainly, we have we know we have needs um, after the referendum uh, when uh, the board and the district reviewed its um, uh, overall capital plan uh, that had a lot of items that were still not part of that process. <clears throat> but then, how is that going to uh, come after 27 and 28 when we've completed that work and putting a policy together uh, that uh, specifically? calls out into that budget plan process uh, funds that will be available after that time and what's available in the district. Okay, objective 4.1 is working to smooth, uh, ensure a smooth transition to a 6-8 middle school model for all of our stakeholders as well. Um, you know, this is one of those places where we are uh, envisioning having a steering committee, a new group that really will focus on exploring the various middle school models out there and really help to determine the course of action for the district. Um, with that larger group, there will be several subcommittees. There's a lot of work to do, and we want to be ready uh, to hit the ground running on that transition year. So making sure that uh, we're set with scheduling, staffing, student supports, um, communication both to the elementary buildings uh, and to our parent community. 
Um, we'll also be looking at just how to ensure that uh, we're involving all of those stakeholders in the planning and the processes as well. And ditto to that. <laughs> <laughs> And then um, objective two in our Building for Success um, goal is focused on ensuring equitable access to curricular and programmatic offerings across the buildings. So the district will secure a demographics and enrollment study, which will provide a starting point for this objective. Additionally, a small working group will assemble to review elementary building usage and ensure a model usage plan is established for equitable use across buildings. Based on the outcomes of these first two action steps, the district will determine if there is a need to examine the elementary school boundaries to ensure equity across the district. Again, that information from action steps A and B will really determine if um, action, steps, uh, action step C is necessary. So this work will include the entire district office team with Jessica and I taking the lead on successful use of the gathered information. So goal five is our other new goal. Cultivating talent is the short title because maximizing the potential of students, staff, and families is a little long to put up there, but there's a lot of things that fall under what's happening here. And, and the first two objectives really emphasize that in order to maximize potential, you have to allow opportunity and access to ensure that that potential can be reached. And so objective five point run really focuses more on the way we are assigning and allocating resources to student programming more in the academic and and, and school-based programs. So we're really going to look at how we do these things, make sure that we are well communicating and well articulating the way we're doing these things, and then talk about how do we know if the decisions we're making and the allocations that we are providing are <coughs> demonstrating success, are getting to us to where we want to be, and that there is consistency with all of those things throughout 13 buildings across the district when we're looking at assigning staff and human resources. And so in order to work through this, we coming out of the previous strategic plan, there was a group called the Resources Review Council that did similar work to this about six years ago, and that group disbanded once we had gotten through some of the objectives originally assigned. We're going to reconvene a group similar to that to really talk through and be able to work through everyone fully understanding how we make staffing and allocation decisions and ensuring that we're currently incorporating all best practice that we're aware of to make that um, successful. The second piece of, or the second objective, I should say, for goal five really looks at opportunities for students um, both within but also outside of the school day. And so 5.2a talks about really looking at how are we identifying students for certain academic programming within District 58 and are we doing that in a way that is equitable and reaching all of the students that we want to. Again, the goal of work like that is never to exclude, but to make sure that there are and no students who ought to be included that aren't based on our current criteria and practice. So it'll involve looking at the, the criteria we use for many of those programs. 5.2b talks about really looking at what is available for students outside of the school day. As we realign to six, eight middle schools, we'll look at what kinds of offerings are going to be available at the middle school, and then continuing to look at what is available at the elementary schools as well. Not necessarily saying we're going to have identical offerings in every space, but wanting to make sure that a student's address doesn't dictate the kinds of opportunities they'll have to explore the talents they may have within themselves. And then there's a third objective to this one, or excuse me, a third action step, which really then also looks at another area that can provide opportunity for students outside of the school day and within sometimes, and that's the, the support and the funding we receive from outside organizations. And so this is not an attempt to have the district take over <coughs> the processes and procedures of outside organizations that support our schools, but really just to begin a conversation to, to talk about the realities of 11 different elementary schools and two different middle schools and what those funding sources can and, and sometimes aren't able to be and how that factors in to student experience across the district. This work is going to live for right now with the district equity leadership team as they've already done some analysis and evaluation through our equity audit report and the, the equity journey continuum of some of that student data and things like that. So it's a really natural place for the work to start. One of the things we always recognize with, with things when we continue to say we want to look at this equitably and be sure that we're, we're working through that, it doesn't live in isolation. And so you've heard the word equitable in, in many of the goal areas that we're talking about tonight. And that's why the district equity leadership team is a 
great place to start this work, but just like most of the other action steps and objectives, there are going to be a lot of different committees and groups that have input on the, these conversations, and also they're going to be responsible for making sure that the work continues to live beyond that initial review. And then just a reminder uh, that in addition to the five goals and the priorities in each, we also were tasked with looking at our vision, our mission, and the guiding principles. We shared that work with the board in July and we committed to bringing that back to the development teams to get their feedback. We did not receive um, any negative feedback with our development teams and so the version that we shared with the board in July will be the version that we'll recommend in the final report and we have that up on the screen as well. And then the next slide simply just shows the guiding principles that we also um, discussed as well. Sorry, someone left the, uh, the clicker up there. And so to finish off uh, our presentation, sorry James, one more, um, the next steps, we'll get final feedback from the board tonight. Now that word final just means the feedback to date. Obviously board members reserve the right to continue to give us feedback. We certainly want to incorporate any feedback from the Board of Education in addition to the feedback we've received from the DLT and our development teams. Uh, between now and uh, November, we want to finalize the written report. We're working with Faith Bear. The final strategic plan, we're, we're putting in a format that would be similar to what you would see in the annual report, you know, the graphics, and it will be a nice communication tool for the district. Uh, the written report that you have online is just more of a nuts and bolts, but we would clean that up and make that look more like the annual report. We then seek board approval on November 13th, and then you know, getting to work on all those things. Uh, this is no small commitment. I, I know we kind of, you know, breeze through it here in the, in the presentation this evening, but there's a lot of work that needs to be done between now and May 9th in these areas. There's a lot of updates we'll need to provide to the DLT, and, and so um, we are committed to doing this work, uh, but it certainly will be extensive, and we would then bring that back on May 9th and let you know how we did in terms of all of that. But also, as we go through the year, if anything would require board approval, that would require dollar amounts. Of course, we'd be bringing that to the board at the um, advice of the uh, DLT. And that is really all that we have for now. Again, just as a reminder, there are more priorities in each one of these goals area, or goal areas, excuse me, that we'll be working on uh, next summer and then bringing that back in a similar uh, fashion. Again, I wanna thank the assistant superintendents, I wanna thank the development teams, I wanna thank the DLT, and the entire community, which included several staff members. This was a lot of work to get to this point, um, but I don't believe it would have been possible without the successful implementation of our last plan. And so we're very proud of the work that took place before. A lot of that work started before I became the superintendent, um, but we were able to finish that off and now we're excited for the next five years. And again, these become our North Star, which we're very excited about. So with that, do we have any questions from the board? Thank you guys, and uh, thank you to the DLT team. I'll open it up to any questions or comments that we have. Anybody? And then this will be coming up for a vote at the, the next board meeting. Mm -hmm. And I know you, you've seen this several times, so um, if there aren't any questions tonight, but if you do think of something, you know, please feel free to reach out to myself and then I can direct you to the um, right leader in terms of the area and we'll um, review those changes that you're suggesting and, and we'll uh, talk about that in the next meeting. Um, but there's a lot in there uh, for the board to go through. So again, please feel free to reach out if you have any questions. And also I wanna thank uh, Member Doshi and uh, also Member Weiner for serving on the DLT because they did give us a, a fair amount of feedback as we went through, which really helped shape uh, where we're at today. I just would say thank you and echo what you said that it takes a village and there was a lot of, lot of people that contributed to this. And while um, Member Doshi and I had several meetings with the DLT on this and seen this several times, um, it was it came to life and it kind of it it changed and there was iterations and there was things that were um, worked through and flushed out. So I'm pleased with what we see here today. I think it reflects what we talked about at previous meetings. So it's exciting and it's also um, thanks to everyone on the team because it it was no it was a heavy lift. Yeah, great job guys and it really does feel like an extension of the the plan that we've done so i think that's one of the reasons why a lot of us feel so comfortable when we're listening to the presentation today so excellent work all right 
Right. You're back up, Liz. I know, yeah, for the <laughs> remainder of the evening. So here we go. Um, so now we are going to go into the end of the year data review and school improvement processes. Um, again, as I had shared two weeks ago, we looked at our fall data um, at that last um, Board of Education meeting, but this really is that wrap up of our 2022 2023 school year data. So we are going to review our spring growth report from MAP, which was previously shared at the June 2023 spring data snapshot. We're also going to review um, our spring growth from IAR. We'll look at combined spring growth of both MAP and IAR. We'll look at IAR proficiency projection results and then IAR prof proficiency projections for this upcoming school year. One thing that I do want to reiterate is when we go through our data review process, where we see successes, we really um, push to replicate while we continue to grow in our curriculum implementation cycles and ensuring that we're working through with our teams um, through PLMs, really great robust conversations about our data. So again, this is just our ECRA um, thresholds so that you can see where those effect sizes land. And while we look at our spring map data, which was shared last June, data showed overall we were in the expected growth range, um, where we see lower than expected growth across both um, reading and math. Um, the data was analyzed and addressed in upcoming school improvement plans. So those plans um, have a focus on small group instruction and systematic resource implementation. So just making sure that we are finding those pockets where maybe we want to see um, additional work done and um, implementing really um, strategic um, school improvement um, plan goals to address those needs. When we look at our IAR data, we saw overall higher than expected growth, and we see those pockets of success across the school buildings, which is fantastic, across both subject areas, math and ELA. Additionally, across our grade levels, which is fantastic to see as well, both in math and ELA, as well as with our subgroups. So again, this is IAR growth data, which is um, something that we really, we do wanna celebrate because um, we saw such an increased growth in our IAR data from 2022 um, to 2023. And then when we look at that combined data, we see similar results. When we look at the school specific, oops, we're still on the combined, I'm sorry. So again, just similar results in um, students um, making more than expected growth or expected growth in all areas. But when we look at those um, proficiency projection results, we do see um, that grade levels exceeded their projected proficiency and new IAR proficiency targets are set for the 2024 administration. When we look at specific school IAR results, those will be shared in November as those are still embargoed um, data through the Illinois School Report Card and we'll look at it through that lens. Again, we saw all grade levels meet their proficiency projection targets and exceed those. And then we have new projection targets based on um, the results of this past year's IAR. This really is um, a testament to the process of identifying an area of need and working to make improvements in that area. So writing really was established as an area of need um, and, and it turned into a, an area of focus and we're seeing improvements through explicit instruction and resource development. When we look at our key performance indicators. That first key performance indicator is our academic proficiency. So that is looking at um, benchmarks and related to our state level data. We're not gonna be able to really find our results of that particular KPI until after the state data is released. So we'll be looking at that in late November. When we look at the key performance indicator number two, which is our academic growth, our goal is to hit an 85% benchmark in all subjects, which we did, with 91% in ELA and 82% meeting growth in math. 
So then we always have our response to data. So we gather all this data, we have meetings, our tier one meetings, our tier two meetings, we look at our student data, and then we have to make a decision about what we're going to do with that. So in review of fall data in connection to spring data, we collected and reviewed any potential summer slide, determined adjustments to intervention groups, and collected a benchmark for any new students in District 58. Um, our, map, our map, spring math and fall math were similar at that grade level data, which is something that is addressed in our school improvement plans. This really is causing some intentional student grouping and consistent review of our curricular pacing and then incorporation of specific intervention and support from our curriculum department. This is something that the instructional coaches, the curriculum coordinators, myself and um, Dr. Eichmiller are really working on ensuring that we are giving the most support that we can to the groups um, of students and teachers and staff that need that. So then we look at our school improvement planning. Using that spring data, buildings, instructional leadership teams met several times to apply the cycles of inquiry process. And then they established one or two goals based on the analysis for implementation this school year. So they took a look at their data and said this is an area of need for our school and made goals accordingly. Those school improvement plans were shared with you um, in your board packet and then um, they will be available to the public on our school websites. Additionally, District 58 added a PBSS goal for each school that states that the tenets of being responsible, respectful, and safe will be, will be implemented throughout the school year, and that is in conjunction with the work of our PBSS committee. District 58 also added a curricular implementation goal for our elementary schools in respect to our school-wide writing adoption, which then further enhances our writing instruction, which was an, er an identified area of need um, in the past few years. Again, each um, building school improvement plan has been shared with their building staff and will be shared with their PTA as well. And then the school improvement plan will be posted on the building's website. Principals who are scheduled for schools um, or spotlights on our schools in the coming months will highlight their school improvement planning process and goals um, as part of the Board of Education meeting each month. And then while review is ongoing, each team will analyze the effects of their school improvement goals on their school specific data in June of 2023. So as we look at that end of the year data and school improvement process and plans, are there any questions? So how does this compare to your previous district, if you kind of look at it through that lens? Well, the way that the, um, the data is reviewed is a little bit different um, in terms of using the ECRA platform. That is not something that um, I had had in my previous district. So it's really opened my eyes in a lens to the way that we evaluate growth here in District 58. What about the school improvement planning process? How would you kind of compare that to previous experience? It's similar. It wasn't necessarily a cycles of inquiry process necessarily, but it was evaluating our school-wide data and then making determinations about what goals we wanted to set, um, you know, moving forward for the upcoming school year. Thank you. Yep. Have you gotten any feedback from any of the staff in, at the beginning of this year was their first time they really got to access the ECRA platform? Sure. Um, not through a training process or not kind of but to start the year that way and we got any kind of feedback on, on how that's going so far yeah absolutely so they are definitely getting more comfortable um, with using that platform and being able to find their data but it is something that we want to continuously approve upon um, especially as we look at our tier one data meetings we want to ensure that our staff feels comfortable and confident in finding that data and ut utilizing it appropriately for setting goals for their students and just to piggyback off of that um, one thing that our staff are are getting accustomed to is how to use a propensity model with effect sizes. This is really the first time that they've ever had a chance to do that. So the first time as we go through and, and we're sitting at data meetings, we're really explaining to the staff how that works, what they can expect with that, because that is certainly something that's new to them. I also think um, a, a delta for us, not, not a negative, but something that we have to continue to, to watch and we have to work with our staff. Clearly, there is a difference between our performance on the state assessment and our performance on NWA MAP. And so a lot of the questions we've been fielding are, how come MAP looked lower and the IAR looked so much higher, right? And so going through that with staff and really looking at the item analysis on, on both tests to take a look at that. Um, of course, both tests measure growth a little bit differently. Liz will present on that at, at, at the November meeting, but in terms of talking with staff, those are some common questions um, 
that we got. But one of the things that I, I've also heard from staff, because I've had the opportunity, just like all the other assistant soups, to, to sit in these meetings, is that um, you know the, the color coding system is a nice, quick way to start focusing conversations. And um, I, I think the challenge for us as we continue to move forward, which we hope to flush out in strategic planning, is how do we ensure that the conversation taking place at O'Neill is in a similar format to the conversation taking place at Herrick and, or at Pierce Downer or at Highland. So we get that consistency across all of our schools when we're having those conversations. So in other words, um, how do we get to that professional learning type of conversation in all of our schools? So those are some things that we're hearing from staff about. How do we build this consistency, the difference in the data? How do we interpret effect sizes, um, which, which is new to our staff? And, and so um, working through that, I think using a platform like ACRA though, it, does provide us a level of comfort because so many other districts are using that, especially um, high achieving districts like ours. And so that does help. It's not just some one-off thing that District 58 happens to be using. There are so many other uh, districts. So even if we have somebody, let's say they're a naysayer and well, I, I don't believe in this effect size, we can point to hundreds of districts that have used this and um, that, that is comforting to them. Um, I have a question about um this sharing the school improvement plan with building staff and PTAs when mm -hmm. um, I don't have somebody in the elementary school school anymore but I do remember um, when you would go to a PTA meeting is is the sharing of the school improvement plan like mm -hmm. where you're sending something out or just talking to the presidents or not to get too in the weeds but like are you showing up to the board or to the PTA meetings whenever it's arranged to, to talk about it, for anyone to ask questions? Is there that kind of touch point anymore? Yeah, so the, the process that we do um, is we post this on the website because not everybody can make a PTA meeting, but really being deliberate in going through each one of those school improvement plans and presenting that to our PTAs, offering a, a chance for question and answer as we go through and really um, highlighting with each school what we're doing at that school because each school is unique. So um, it's, it's a format that isn't dissimilar to what we're doing right now or what we would have just done with our safety planning. So we just did a, a safety plan presentation at all of our PTA meetings to share with them what we're doing this year and everybody had a chance to hear the presentation, ask questions about that presentation, what does that look like in their particular school. I happened to be at Puffer's last Thursday night and so it was a nice give and take back and forth. It is much more than just hey, if you want to look at the school improvement plan, it's on the website, check it out and call me with questions. It, it, it's that give and take, that dialogue that we are really trying to capture because one of the ultimate goals with cycles of inquiry process is not only we dive into what we need to work on instructionally, but we work with our families to also assist us at home as uh, you know we're going through these things, whether that's the behavior goal or whether that's the math goal. We want our families to be informed and um, our families are great. They, they really want to help participate. A lot of the times we get questions well, what can I do at home, right? Or, or what are you focusing on at school? This allows us to do that. Right. At the last board meeting, I remember actually going and looking at my old schools to see, yeah. and it was listed, so I know where it is now, but I, went, <laughs> I wanted to prove yeah. out that it was there, and yeah. it was there, so. And the other thing, we're, we're, you know, as we get more deeper into the cycles of inquiry process that we started during the pandemic, really um, highlighting to our families, not making it a mystery what we're doing in terms of school improvement, being very transparent oh, about the data page. and being very transparent about this is our plan to address that um, data. Yep. Thank you very much. Any other questions, comments? Sorry. Okay. Okay. Question. It's kind of unfair for you to give you this question. Um, <laughs> oh. But that was all right. Well, <laughs> okay. you just arrived. I'm, I'm just curious. And, and I'm, um, we keep seeing third grade popping. Mm -hmm. um, when compared to all the other grade levels. Do we have a hypothesis to explain what is going so well at third grade? Well, at this, I mean, uh, this yeah. is probably, I mean, uh, not looking at two weeks ago, but like going back to the spring, mm -hmm. probably, uh, that was last winter's mm -hmm. data, probably, I would say probably the, the data from a year ago, maybe sure. a year and a half ago. Third grade has always been, has always had statistically significant growth um, in either math or the LA or both. 
What explains that? Sure. So I think um, a number of things can explain that. I think if you um, talk to the team, it's really looking at the intentionality of their planning for their students um, like specifically, this. but then also looking at um, their pacing. So ensuring that we are following what that curriculum guide tells us and ensuring that we are um, working towards just successful implementation of our core resources, making adjustments as needed. But then we also want to make sure that we're replicating some of those successes um, in our other grade levels as well. Sure. I mean, I guess, I guess I have a, a I'm, the reason why I'm confused because we have uh, 11 schools with their great teams and they don't do a lot of collaboration, sure. uh, um, you know, uh, across the district. Mm -hmm. um, so, so I guess what, what you're saying is like just the, the is it, is it a, is it, well, top-down work that, that, that the central office is doing to really drive leadership on the third grade teams? I mean, no, I, and I think that um, in terms of equity, we try to ensure that we are accessing every grade level um, as, as often and as focused as we can. Um, so I don't know that there's necessarily like an anomaly of, of something that they're specifically getting different than any other grade level. Um, but as I start to build kind of those relationships with grade level teams, it may be something that I, you know, see pop in, in a different way. Sure. So. I also think one of the things that with the NWA math assessment, which plays into this number, is the difference in the K2 test and, uh, um, you know, the 3-5 test as well. Mm -hmm. That plays into it some of the anomalies. I, I think what we do very well compared to a lot of other districts is that early literacy in our K-2 program because that, that original map test, uh, the map for primary, is predominantly read to students. And so what we see in a lot of districts is their numbers fall off when kids switch to that new test. We don't see that as much, so that was one of those ahas that we had because we're seeing stronger early literacy numbers, which, which does help boost that third grade data set compared to some of our peer districts where they might see it fall off. So for instance, I know Steve had asked a question about uh, Liz's previous district, we always struggled with third grade data in my previous district because what we were seeing when kids took that primary map was they were artificially held up a little higher because it was read to them. And when they had to read that test on their own, we saw them kind of plummet. So we don't see as much of this. The other thing in the data, we had an extraordinarily strong third grade group last year. This group is, is also strong, but not as strong as that third grade group. So we're starting to see those numbers balance out a little bit more than they, they have in the past. Where, um, So in particular, what we wanted to see was the fourth grade data this fall, yeah. because the third grade data was really strong. So when you look at math in particular, and you're looking at proficiency by grade, you know, um, third grade had 66%, fourth grade had 62%. So we're starting to see those really strong numbers, and, and we're hoping that that will continue with the amount of work that we're doing in that foundational reading um, at, at the primary grade as well. Um, still having trouble, Greg, though, um, you know, full disclosure, putting our exact finger on what is it about that, that that's working, but we do think that some of that is playing into the anomaly of uh, the tests that we give um, and, again, how we compare with other districts in terms of literacy. So we are seeing some really encouraging things in, in terms of strong foundational reading, and that's carrying over into mathematics when kids are reading word problems and things like that. So you're saying it's like a payoff really from the work that happened in those first three years, K through two, and then that's really where it kind of, it's manifesting. We are not, that is correct. We're not seeing the same dips in the NWA map assessment, at least the last few years that um, we saw in particular in the past or what other districts are seeing. Um, but that is certainly still something that we're looking at. Um, we, we talk a lot of, at, at the board table about pockets of excellence and, and how are we replicating those, and that is certainly something that we're, um, we're looking at as well. Um, also, don't forget acceleration starts at this particular grade level, and so, you know, that can give kids a boost as well because we know one of the biggest effect sizes is accelerating students when they're ready. And so we now have kids that are ready to be accelerated, and third grade is the first chance they're getting for that, and that can really help ramp them up as well in the achievement. So acceleration, some of the early performance and literacy, I think are both adding into that a lot. And I think as we start to look at um, our ELA recommendations um, and pilots that are going on, I know Mrs. Priester is going to, to talk about that in our committee updates. We're really excited about the future of that work as well. Can I ask, <clears throat> I'll ask a question about 
something that I'm wondering, and I'm wondering, okay, how do we use this data to help us answer this question? So I wonder about how are we doing over time? Snapshots in time are a data point, but as a board, we have the you know, privilege of serving for a handful of years, you know, five, six years, and so on. And we want to be able to see like, okay, well, how are we doing over the course of time? How does ECRA data help us understand how are we trending? Where, where, have, we had, where have we been? Where are we going? Sure. Are there views in the data that we can see to do that or something that, something that you're able to see that we might be able to see soon? Um, I don't know that there's necessarily a report that ECRA would um, provide for that, but it really, that trend data is built in specifically to each student's propensity score. So it's something that is kind of, um, you know, addressed as each um, student gets their new goal for the upcoming um, school year. So it really is kind of built into that model. In terms of ways to present the data, we can absolutely look at uh, additional ways to kind of share that information. And then also to piggyback off of that, though, we are very curious. You know, we had a conversation last spring at the board table that we, we took to heart and we really tried to look across our data because it appeared in the spring map that our achievement level started off very, very high and then the further you went through our system, that achievement level kind of went down. So our K-1-2 percentiles were much higher than our 6, 7, and 8 percentiles. Um, in this particular data set, as we look through it, we still see a little bit of that in math, but in ELA, we're actually seeing higher or if not the same percentiles um, between our younger students and our older students. So that was certainly almost an alarming trend that we saw because we, we certainly don't want our percentiles in eighth grade to look that discrepant from our third grade percentiles, if that makes sense. And so we wanted to know the longer kids are in our system, is that having a detrimental impact, which we certainly hope not, or is it having a positive impact? So we were relieved to see some of those numbers um, hold steady or get better this time. The other thing that um, James and I looked at, and I don't have the numbers in front of me right now, uh, we started to look at this last year, and we're going to continue to look at this, is the impact of mobility. You know, is there a difference between students who start with us in kindergarten and go through our entire system through eighth grade versus kids who maybe came in fourth or fifth grade? And what we did see in the trend data that we analyzed was that the longer you in our, you're in our system, the stronger you do. And so that was very encouraging for us as well to see, you know, does mobility have an impact? We knew, we knew mobility had an impact, but we wanted to see what, what that impact was. And so that allows us to target kids that are coming into our district and provide them with more interventions to hopefully flatten out that curve a little bit. So I, I'm hopefully answering your question, Kara, about what happens you know, as we look across our system. Now, in terms of what we're doing in our district, I think one of the biggest changes between now and five years ago is the school improvement planning process that we have in place. Uh, that was not there five years ago, and so to be able to have that in place and there's a reason it wasn't there five years ago we were building all of our curricular areas we had to get those up it, uh, running and so once we did that our school improvement process is certainly helping with that as well does that answer your question on trending because that's I, what i because I, I guess the way i'm looking at it is like say <laughs> we look at one of these reports and we get yellow for everything and then the next report we get we get yellow for everything so we're kind of taking like almost two steps back if you will if we kind of have two yellows in a row and then if we just kind of make a small uh, step change for, that actually improves then we get green the next time so like if we continue to go backwards does that change the, so, the baseline so our our um, kind of checkpoints our fall and winter data is showing us our um, path to hitting our student our, our students hitting their propensity scores um, in in the spring so really we are looking at a spring to spring data analysis with fall and winter kind of being just those those touch points and giving us opportunity to make adjustments in our instruction as needed and then when we're seeing some really strong spring data um, that that came out of this last report that's showing that they did um, the students did hit their their um, projected scores or were within that expected growth range and then a new propensity score is then set for that upcoming school year. I also think Steve to answer your question um, at least in my view and pushback if I'm not this is precisely why we have those key performance indicators right because 
we need to look overall, like you said, sometimes if you have a lower score, that factors in, or sometimes if you have a higher mm -hmm. score, it makes it. So are we hitting those key performance indicators? Um, we saw with growth, we were certainly on track. Um, we have to wait and see once all the school report card data comes out to see if we hit that as well. And then we take a look at those and then see if any adjustments need to be made based on how we did. And, and so I think to answer that question, are we at the end of the day meeting our key performance indicators? I also think what, what is useful about the data that we share here, it's the combination of all the assessments instead of just one or in isolation. So, um, but what we're seeing with the key performance indicators is that we are on track and so that is certainly encouraging. To answer your question about my question, Steve, I think the answer is, <laughs> I think the answer is in these KPIs mm -hmm. at a, as a starting point on seeing the trend lines on those KPIs. Yes. Right? And then I think as a district, as a leadership team, um, if we don't see ourselves on track on those KPIs, we dig deeper on where within the trend line are we falling right. short. But at least I want, I'd like to be able to start by saying how are we looking on those KPIs? Um, and I say that to start because it's still only going to be four data points each year. And <clears throat> I'm a bit, a bit of a pause of like, does that give, a, give us enough information to be able to say our investments in math in 2021 are showing us the positive trend we want to be able to see? Because I'm, I'm not able to tease that out through these color code indicators. I can't see over the course of years because I see it at any given point in time based on at, at most the last 12 months did a student do what they, we expected them to do. And so I, I guess one way I could react to that is <clears throat> I'm expecting to only see greens and blues. And if I see any yellows, that means we're off track. But I feel like that'd be overreacting. And so I want to be careful about uh, how I read these colors if if that's our indication for trend lines. Well, I, oh, go ahead, Liz. So, and as we're planning for instruction and making determinations in our classrooms, we do recognize that these are those touch points. So we're using our classroom data, our formative data. We have some great resources that the teachers are able to use in order to make determinations of students hitting their standards um, in, through their classroom assessments. And those are other pieces of data that we're using within our classroom instruction um, to make instructional decisions. Yeah, I, and just to piggyback off of that, I think when we're looking at the accurate point, Kareth, you summed it up perfectly. I, I don't think we should ever over-celebrate. You know, we could certainly do so in this case with all the blues and, and dunk the basketball, right? But we know sometimes it's not always blue. And, and so how are we using these touch points in a formative sense to change our school improvement planning and change our, our pedagogy? I think if we're looking for summative information in terms of how did we do? Are we on track? I think that's where the key performance indicators come in. But I also think that's where this combined report can help as well, because that combined report is taking all the assessments from all of last year, putting it in and saying, how did you do compared to where we thought you'd be? And then that sets our targets for this upcoming uh, school year. So in a combined sense, I think we, we did very well. Uh, but again, we have to see how that shakes out in our key performance indicators. And this will only be year two of those key performance indicators to see how well we were doing with last year really being the implementation year. So I think we have to keep monitoring those key performance indicators. We have to monitor for two, you know, are they unrealistic targets or are they too low? And if they're too low, then we have to adjust them upwards as well. And I think that's what the DLT can keep providing us with feedback. Also, because the SECRA system is newer to us as a school district, that's where we are still working very closely with John Gatta in the ECRA team, in, in even going as far as for uh, the IAR, purchasing that analysis from ECRA to see how are we stacking up on this exam toward, or, or, or test, excuse me, toward our peer districts to make sure that we are on target and we are making the growth that, that we had hoped for. So um, I think all signs indicate we're, we're on that path, but we can't take any data set for granted. We need to just keep looking at it over and over again. Um, but each time we get this, I can assure the board, we are going back, we are having very robust conversations with our building leaders, with our teams, and I think we're getting better and better at that as time goes on. Yeah, and additionally, when those reports are available, of course, those will be shared with the board. Mm -hmm. So just to kind of share my thinking out loud, just so we, we put in a system, 
we're in year two. We're going to have the second year data points end of November, and then we continue the path that we're on. I think we continue the path we're on, but always reviewing that with the district leadership team to make sure, you know, when we set those, we work with John Guy mm -hmm. on those key performance indicators, and we said this is where we believe we should be, but we always have to be cognizant of is it too easy of a target, is it too hard of a target, and then make those adjustments accordingly based on the, the data that we have. Um, but so far, it seems to be serving us well, and certainly we're finding, you know, as, as administrators, we're finding that there are pockets of success that we need to replicate and there are growth opportunities that we need to continue to have conversations about. And with this data, it better equips us to be able to go in there and do that quickly. Any other questions, Kenneth? All right, so then as we look at our next board meeting, which is where I will present the information about the Illinois School Report Card and summative designations, I did just want to give an overcap of how those summative designations are determined. So the Illinois Report Card is released by the state every October to show how the state district and each school are doing in a range of um, their educational goals. Three versions will be available, and all report card data is embargoed until October 29th, so that is next week. Um, we will have a full discussion about that data at our November 13th Board of Education meeting. Um, so when we look at summative designations, that stems from the Every Student Succeeds Act, which is federal legislation that requires each state to create an accountability plan. So these summative designations have now been in place for um, a number of years, and it's intended to be educational and equitable and not punitive, designed to identify schools in the state that need support and then to provide that support. So there are four summative designations that a school can receive. Exemplary is in the top 10%, I'm sorry, the top 10% um, of all schools. Commendable is kind of in that middle range from the top 10% um, to the bottom 5%. Um, if you have a targeted subgroup of students, um, that would be um, something that would provide or give a school a um, targeted support summative designation, and then comprehensive support is in the bottom 5% of all schools. When we look at what makes up summative designations at the elementary level, we are looking at academic indicators in terms of ELA growth and proficiency, math growth and proficiency, science proficiency. Last year it was science participation. This year it has changed to proficiency. And then um, English language progress to proficiency. That is only um, identified in schools that have um, a subgroup of English learners. So that does not apply to all of our schools. If um, it does not apply to one of our schools, that 5% in the ELP to P is distributed evenly across the other academic performance indicators. And then we have um, two additional um, indicators, which is our chronic absenteeism and our climate survey, which is five essentials. So when we look at that, our math and ELA proficiency equates to 15% of our summative designation. And proficiency targets were um, redistributed after the pandemic. So those are um, proficiency targets for, just an example of proficiency targets for third and fourth grade ELA. And then again, just um, an example of math proficiency targets for um, seventh and eighth grade. Math and ELA growth makes up 50% of summative designations, and that state calculation is based upon each student's performance on the spring 2023 um, IAR versus students with the same scores in 2019, which is considered their baseline. So when you're looking at how the um, students um, score on the IAR compared to peers who have scored the same as them in previous IAR administrations. This is a different calculation than ECRA. ECRA takes into account more individualized targets and localized information as opposed to state um, level information. Science is 5%, which is a percentage of students proficient on the um, Illinois Science Assessment. Um, and those proficiency targets are based on state average performance in 2021. And then that ELP to P is calculated with 20 or more students in a building. So in District 58, those um, schools are O'Neill, El Sierra, and Indian Trail. When not calculated, that 5% is divided among the remaining academic categories. 
Additionally, that chronic absenteeism is the percentage of students who are absent for 10% of the school year for any reason, and then that scoring bans incentivize study and improving rates. Um, this is something that we have been talking to our MTSS committee and PBSS committee about, um, and the importance of students being um, available and attending school in order to access their um, educational resources. And then our climate survey is the five essentials with 95% student participation giving all points for that. Student groups are defined as um, reported when 20 or more students are represented. So those student groups include race and ethnicity, and then different programs, including children with disabilities, economically disadvantaged English learners, and former English learners. So that process takes that performance data, turns it into an indicator score, an index score, and then ultimately we get our summative designations based on that. It is a lot of behind the scenes math that goes into creating um, the summative designation scores. Um, and we are able to then get a weighted index score to determine summative designations. So when we take a look at our index scores, we're looking at all students, but then we also look at those student groups in determining what is going to um, account for a particular summative designation. So those exemplary um, schools are in that top 10% of the um, schools in Illinois, and then our comprehensive schools are in that lowest 5%. So the preliminary index scores, an exemplary index for this upcoming um, Illinois report card is an 81.33 or above. Comprehensive and targeted index was at 34.35 or below. So in the previous slide, there was a sample school with a 72.73 for all students. And so that school would be um, considered commendable with um, all their subgroups above that 34.35, which is that comprehensive and targeted index. So again, I'm giving you this information because at our upcoming Board of Education meeting, we will review what all of our school's designations are. That information will not be released until 9 o'clock in the morning on Monday, October 30th. Um, and that's when those um, the report card data will be posted to our website. We'll share communication of our summative designations in an upcoming Communicate 58. And then we'll make sure that the community understands um, our summative designations through small group discussions and forums as needed. And then that November November 13th will be our spotlight at the Board of Education meeting of our Illinois School Report Card, and there we will also look at school IAR data results. Questions? Questions or comments? It's all a lot of repeat information from previous years as well. Can I get clarification sure. on one thing? Of that course. was, it looks like you were saying that it was comparing to 2019. That's so where we're just basically taking all the pandemic years out and, and just kind of correct. So that's that baseline. That baseline. Here. Correct. Okay. And then, and the longer we live in this system, too, the more things that are becoming apparent, and, and we'll be sharing the, the full data. Um, and I'm going to sound like a broken record. Uh, <laughs> absenteeism is a big issue for us, and it mm -hmm. is something that. Um, we really have to continue to focus in on from a district level, a school level, um, an individual level. That is going to be something that does impact our overall summative uh, designations. Uh, and so again, working through that, trying to develop strategies to improve in, in that particular area. We'll get more into that at, at the November meeting, but that is one of my biggest takeaways as the superintendent this year. And it, it's not, you know, we've got work in, in other areas as well, but because it's 20% of the overall score, that can be the difference maker for the school in terms of are you exemplary in the top 10% or are you, uh, you know, a commendable school. Not that there's anything wrong with either one of these. Uh, my other warning I'll give every single year, if you remember No Child Left Behind, this does have a No Child Left Behind bend to it. If you go to one of those slides that Liz shared and you look at, 2023 or 33 excuse 33. me it, it does get to where they're expecting you know 90 percent proficient at, at all those levels and, and we know from no child left behind we ran into trouble with that and the state abandoned it as soon as the high performing schools like at downers grove could no longer meet that threshold so that is something that we're going to monitor the other caveat i will throw in you know we have a new state superintendent it is not uncommon as um 
testing contracts expire, but so does some of this as well. And so what we'll be seeing is to stay committed to this long term. Is this an interim thing? Um, you know, and, and we'll continue to monitor all that. But more of that in November, but certainly some things that we're going to continue to look at as a school district. It, the absenteeism is the second heavily weighted Yes. Pieces. Yes. Yeah. And, and, yeah. and so what we saw this year, and again, I can't share this data publicly yet. Um, you know, we did make significant strides, especially in ELA, in terms of overall achievement. Where we saw a backslide in our district was with um, absenteeism data, and, and that is not unique to District 58. Um, I've been sharing articles, you know, about attendance since the pandemic. Um, but we are not seeing kids attend school at the same rate we did in 19 or prior to the pandemic. That's an issue across the country. It's an issue across Illinois, but it is certainly an issue here in Downers Grove. And like we always say, it could be an issue across the country. It could be an issue across the state, but it's our issue now here in, in District 58. And what are we going to do about it to improve it? And I think one of the biggest things that we need to do is just highlight the importance of it, not for a summative designation, but the importance of just being in school on a regular basis for that student. Um, you know, we all, if we miss a couple of days of work, we know how hard it is to catch up, right? Now imagine being a student who's gone 20% of the school year plus, that makes it very challenging. Now there are legitimate reasons sometimes where a kiddo might have to be absent, um, health reasons, things like that. That's not the child we're talking about here. We're talking about, you know, maybe it's school refusal, maybe it's uh, a family just, not paying too much attention to the number of absences and as they creep up or you know extended vacations on top of break periods those are the things that we really need to address and you know that gets very personal and, and people will push back but we really have to talk about what's best for kids and in, in getting them to school on a more regular basis is we're not talking about one or two days here or there we're talking about 20 percent of the school year being gone that means you know basically one out of every five days you're gone that's significant. Well, and it's something to really think about. We were talking about it today at our MTSS meeting, where at this point, um, today is day 41 of school. At this point, we're only talking about someone being absent four days, mm -hmm. and that's 10% of, of the school year. So it's a really interesting um, calculation as you start to kind of go across the school year. Um, you know, 18 days does seem like a lot at the end of the year, but when you look at it just being two days per month, it, it adds up quickly. Do you, how did they, um, like in terms of how that 20% affects a, an individual school score, like if it's it, how many kids have to hit that threshold for it to, like how do they, how does that work? What we can do is, is um, in the November meeting, we will show kind of the breakdown of the spreadsheet, which I think uh -huh. will, sometimes it's easier to, if you just sure. see it, yeah. um, but we will, you'll be able to see for each school okay. how much that weighted on the school and whether they hit a threshold or didn't based on that uh -huh. uh, number. So we will we will share that with uh, you know, the like, board. Does it take one kid to, to be absent more than the 20% or does it take 10 kids or is it something well, I think like that's gonna, range, like, you know. It's gonna depend on how many kids are in your school, sure. how and many and kids fell on that. Kids. So it's a percentage of the percentage, sure. if that sure. makes sense. <laughs> mm -hmm. okay. So certainly if you have a smaller school mm -hmm. in a handful of kids in a neighborhood school concept who are gone, right. th so you could see schools like a Bel Air get disproportionately impacted by something mm -hmm. like that if they have a, uh, a larger percent of kids who are, who are absent, where a Leicester, where you've got 450 kids, if you've got the same number of students, that yeah. percentage is gonna be lower for Leicester yeah. than it is. Also, um, the schools that have EL, they have a, a, another factor in, in uh, theirs that they meet that threshold with 20 kids or more. So they're gonna have a little different matrix than the schools that don't have that. And so that's something that we have to look at too. But we will show that, and I think it will will be helpful to sure. kind of understand that contextually. Mm -hmm. Yeah, real numbers always make it a little, e a little easier, right? <laughs> um, so the next, the actually the final part of our. Um, curriculum workshop is our curricular committee updates and I just want to commend our curriculum coordinators they have just done a fantastic job um, with implementing um, all of our curricular committees so I'm going to ask them to come up and share information um, with the Board of Education in the committees that they um, spearhead and um, share those updates
right, good evening. I'm gonna to share tonight an update on our ELA and our writing work this school year. To begin, ELA picked up where we left off, working through the curricular review process. As I presented in the spring, we were moving forward with piloting some new resources across our kindergarten through eighth grade um, classrooms. The committee really left with some key goals, and you can see those reflected on the slide. For in K-5, we're really looking for a systematic and explicit foundational skills program to support our learners in kindergarten through second grade. We're also looking to support that consistent structure of the ELA block, emphasizing instruction in those different areas of literacy um, in those different grade levels, and making sure we have a guaranteed and viable curriculum in all of our grade levels. So guaranteed meaning all of our students are experiencing that across all of our schools and grades, and viable meaning Whatever is um, listed for the day fits in the day, fits in the unit, and fits across the school year. The, in grade six or eight, our committee goals again with that guaranteed and viable curriculum, but also really looking for a curriculum that it has that middle schooler in mind, has those complex engaging texts for a middle schooler, activities and that application that is connected to that explicit instruction from that teacher in reading and writing, and again, that consistent professional learning to support instruction in those grade levels. To give a snapshot of the resources we are piloting this school year, I've listed them in K2. We are piloting the two foundational skills program. Currently in classrooms, we're piloting UFLY foundations. And then in about mid-November, we'll be transitioning to bridge to reading. In K through five, we talked about in the spring how we are going to pilot the updated benchmark advance, the new copyright of 2022. Currently in our classroom, we utilize benchmark, benchmark advance 2018. And so in this pilot, we're really looking to notice that enhancement to their reading comprehension instruction and also that word work instruction in grades three through five. And then in our middle school grades, grades six through eight, we are piloting two different programs. We're piloting Amplify ELA, which is currently happening in our classroom, and then we'll be transitioning in mid-November to Common Lit 360. On this slide, I tried to capture just how many classrooms and teachers and students, right, by listing those classroom numbers, are involved with this pilot. And I wanted to take a moment to thank all of those teachers that are putting in that extra time, not only planning for instruction for their students, but also tack tackling the task of unpacking a new curriculum with new activities and new texts and making sure we're delivering wonderful instruction again for all of our students. This slide, I had this image um, in the spring as well, but I wanted to bring it back just to highlight the amazing work our ELA committee did to um, to make sure we're building skilled readers and looking at all those components of instruction, we wanna make sure we have a solid foundation represented in our curricular materials. Not that you teach these, right, in isolation, but making sure we have strong resources for our teachers so they can have strong instruction in their classroom. Our EL ELA committee goals are reflected here. Really, it's around our pilot this school year. We'll be coming back together in January to review that pilot pilot feedback from our K through eight teachers. And we'll also be asking our middle school grade students to give us feedback on the resources as well. Um, to, and then that will help us determine any new uh, resources we, will, um, we would be interested in for the next school year. Based on that, we'll be thinking about bridging that instruction from core to any intervention or resource classrooms to make sure students have a clear programming, and then also considering how that impact any specialized programs that would utilize the resource and any district report card implement implications. We'll also plan for any of that professional development on those resources or those instructional practices. We'll spotlight the pilot work for the board at the curriculum workshop in February. I'm thrilled to tell you about the school-wide implementation this school year. We began the year with professional learning on Institute Day for our K-5 through teachers. Myself and the instructional coaches have been leading the professional learning this fall. Almost monthly, we're coming back together, both previewing that next unit in instruction, but also lay layering on those instructional strategies that are going to make our teachers successful in the classroom and in turn our students. So over the course of this year, our teachers will build their knowledge of the curriculum 
so we are successful for years to come with our new writing curriculum. We've experienced several initial successes um, in the classroom. Kids are excited about writing. They are building their stamina and building that volume of what they can write in a sitting. Um, and these are really that, those goals of our launch unit in all of our classrooms in K through five. As with any new implementation, I think my favorite part is it really gives us that opportunity to focus our conversations about best practices and instruction in that area and talk about what that looks like in the classroom and what we're seeing from our students um, because of those practices. I've had the opportunity to be in many classrooms and in many what we call writing celebrations. So at the end of each unit, um, kids share their writing, whether that is getting up in um, front of the class and reading what they wrote or sharing with a buddy. It looks a little bit different in every classroom. But I have a video to share with you today from a third grade classroom at Leicester. One of our coaches, instructional coaches, Nicole Ring, partnered up with um, Mrs. Megan Beard um, for this unit and they were uh, able to capture just over a minute of their writing celebration. So in this video you will see kids on a gallery walk and um, reading their peers writing and then also just reflecting on the unit. Um, one thing I, I hope you take away is the pride and the joy on the kids faces during, during this time. Um, it was what I took away and I continue to take away from our classrooms. Show, uh, happy to share with you that window into the classroom. And so to wrap up, our writing committee will be meeting a couple times this school year. We'll be finishing out the next steps in the curriculum review process. We'll be um, building our, our parent education. So those grade level overviews that are now on our website, we'll be building out the writing drop down on that. We'll be looking at our assessment data on writing and thinking about how we can continue to enhance that, that our rubric usage and how that is guiding our instruction. We'll be thinking about differentiation, both supporting students that are maybe below level in their writing abilities but also thinking about those students that are ready for more and how to continue to push them in their achievement and writing. We'll be gathering feedback from our staff on this first year of implementation so we're able to not only assess that um, fidelity of implementation making any changes to a scope and sequence or a pacing but also plan for next year's professional learning. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. I do not have a cute video of kids, so you get to hear from me. <laughs> um, I just have a brief update for you on our gifted committee work this year and where we left off and then our MTSS committee. When I saw you last April, um, we had shared a proposal of where we wanted to go and the work that our committee had done. As you know, the committee has been tasked with evaluating our gifted program and those services for our students. And we have a really strong, uh, passionate group of members and stakeholders that are listed up there, gifted teachers, classroom teachers, and administration. Um, we had proposed being able to spend this year working through details of a school-based model with a three-phase process of 
bringing first fourth grade um, into the school base and then the following year fifth grade and then the third year would be when sixth grade goes to middle school. We'd also like to add in some other content areas for our middle school classrooms as well. So we have been working through a number of things in tandem. It's been quite a, quite a tango. There's no one topic or initiative that can prioritize over the other. So it's, it's been a bit of a chicken and the egg. We're working through the criteria process and identification, making sure that we have that wide enough cat, uh, net that is cast to really identify our students and including our twice exceptional and our EL learners. We've been working with Sandy Cristobal, our other curriculum coordinator for that as well. And the dual committee has been doing some MTSS training which aligns to this as well. We know that our students spend a lot of time in the general education classroom as well. So we wanna provide a lot of support for differentiation for our teachers. Last spring we attended the doable differentiation workshop with Dan Kaisi and have been bringing that back and we'll be presenting that in November at all of our grade level meetings and continuing through Institute Days with some support for differentiation. And then just last week, I had the pleasure of presenting with three of our committee members from the Gifted Committee, uh, Lori Smith, Janice Conboy, and Daniel Sands. We presented at the Illinois Association of Gifted Children Conference and then attended the conference as well. So we have a lot of information to bring back to our committee. So we'll continue that work, some book studies um, for the GNKC book as well. And then in the winter, once we continue to work through a lot of these logistics, come to you with a recommendation for the proposal with a lot more details. For the MTSS committee, which it really aligns nicely with transitioning from gifted, um, MTSS in our district, we have the committee who's really been working at streamlining what are our systems and processes that we have in the district. We've historically worked off of an RTI, a response to intervention model, which in the past RTI really goes off of looking at our most struggling students and academically for the most part. You can see on the image up here, MTSS is this giant umbrella and under it there are a wealth of components that go in there including that RTI model. So RTI is that triangle, whereas MTSS is more of a diamond. We have our students who are struggling, we have our students who are on grade level, and then we have our students who are high performing, high achieving, gifted, and so forth. And we wanna make sure that we're differentiating to meet the needs, not only academically, but MTSS also includes social and emotionally. So the committee has uh, just met actually today. We incorporated a reflection on what we did last year, making sure the committee has that strong background knowledge of what MTSS, that multi-tiered systems of support is. Um, it's a lot of lingo. We have our tier one, which should meet 85% or more of our student population needs, academically and socially, emotionally. Then we go into tier two, which is where we have some students who just need a little bit more, a little bit of a boost. They might need a check-in and check-out with a, an adult in the building, or they might need a little bit of core plus more, and another set of guided reading throughout the week with their teacher. Whatever the data really shows that the child needs, we can then meet it through that tier two. And then tier three is where we get into the more intense tertiary supports, where they're gonna need um, more frequency, more higher intensity of support. And the goal is to move our children from that tier three intense support back into tier two and back into tier one. So we see students that might fluctuate throughout there based on what's going on academically or at home. Um, attendance is listed up here because we know that attendance is something that impacts our students not only <coughs> academically but socially in the classroom as well. And that's something that our district, um, as was mentioned earlier, that we're looking more closely at, especially as we've come out of the pandemic, we wanna make sure that we're keeping our students in the classrooms and at school. And then we have our dual language work. We've been doing some training for MTSS for our dual language students. And Sandy will talk a little bit more about that. And then finally, our positive behavior support systems and that committee just met as well. Making sure that we have consistent systems across the district for our behavior supports. Um, and then again, uh, differentiation, which I think you've heard me talk a lot about tonight and previous nights as well. But we want to make sure that we're providing that differentiated support for our teachers because our students are in this wide continuum of abilities and needs.
Good evening. Buenas noches, sport. Uh, my name is Andy Cristobal. Um, I'm just very excited to share with you that our dual language program is growing. Um, our two-way program is now in first grade. Last year was our first implementation of kindergarten. Um, and this year, we were able to have a full house. Um, and that was thanks to the work of not only our dual language teachers and staff, but truly the community um, understanding the vision um, of our program, which is for our children to become bilingual, speak two languages, biliterate, read and write in those two languages, and bicultural, being able to navigate two different cultures, in this case, Latin culture, um, in this, and being able to see that throughout their academics. So we're excited to be able to have, this, have our first grade um, dual language two-way start. Our bilingual parent advisory committee, which is a group of parents that meet four times a week, has also grown in attendance. They really work to promote bilingualism and to understand how to support bilingual students and English learners. And we have our first meeting tomorrow night at El Sierra at 6 p.m. If, um, if you would like to attend. And um, they have done a lot of great work, not only with um, understanding how bilingual, um, biliteracy education functions, but also to really be that echo in the community. And I credit the, the BPAC for truly getting the word out there and that one of the reasons why we had such a good turnout for for this new kindergarten cohort was because of, of all their work to to promote the program um, the last year our fabulous teachers are uh, very talented they um, teach in both languages they were able to get training from the Center of Applied Linguistics which is uh, a great a resource that, um, that is recognized nationwide and they were able to get training on what does it mean to teach dual language. What does it mean to teach for biliteracy? What does it mean to teach a bilingual brain? What does that look like in comparison to a monolingual classroom? So this year we see we are starting to see the fruits of that. Um, our teachers are feeling more confident in um, being able to maneuver bilingualism education and, and most of them have experience teaching bilingual students and uh, bilingual education and so we are very excited that all of our teachers now have this, the same training. Um, last year, because it was our first year of implementing uh, two-way in kinder, we wanted to make sure we hit some of our goals, which was promote it to the community, make sure that um, this is something that District 58 is very proud of, that this is something that also makes us unique across our area, that the fact that we have a dual language program and a two-way program, which means that not only are we servicing Spanish speakers, but now we're inviting English speakers to learn Spanish. And so um, we did a lot of work last year to promote that uh, to promote our program in the community. And so we also provided our dual language staff training, and we also wanted to make sure that we started to address the multi-tier support systems for our bilingual students. Um, bilingual students learn differently than monolingual students. It's not two brains in one, but instead it's one brain that functions um, in two languages, and how do we maneuver that, and what do their goals look like, and what does it mean for them to get tier two support, tier three support, and in what language. So we wanted to make sure that um, those conversations began and that is one of the reasons why uh, we're so happy that uh, this year our focus is on how do we support our bilingual students our English learners our Spanish learners into making sure that they are getting all their needs met and in the language that in the target language um, that they're in and so we're very excited to be working as a team to truly understand ways that we can look at our data and make sure that we're making good gains into that pathway to biliteracy because we want all of our children to get the seal of biliteracy once they graduate high school. Um, we're also very excited because a curriculum is tricky. Be, uh, you know, there's a, a very few curriculum that have two the two um, languages that are promoting both biliteracy and bilingualism and at the same time being true to the culture. But we are piloting right now Benchmark um, Adelante and Benchmark Advance and we're actually piloting the 2023 edition. Um, this coincides a little bit with what monolingual classrooms are doing and we're trying to see is this, is this uh, curriculum getting us to that biliteracy pathway? Is it helping our students gain both English and both Spanish? So we're excited um, that our kindergarten and our first grade teachers are piloting that uh, resource and then we want to continue to support our teach teaching staff on ways to Im continue to improve their instruction for our um, students so for example we have different strategies that we use in the dual language classroom such as bridging is when we connect the the target language which in this case for example could be Spanish and how do we bridge what we're learning into English and so how do we now that you've heard this in, sp in Spanish 
what are some of the connections we can make in English? So um, we're also wanting to make sure that our teachers are very well versed in metalinguistic con connections, which is what are some of the grammar rules that coincide to the other language and so forth. So this year we're truly focusing on providing them that support um, and for their instruction and making sure that they feel confident in teaching bilingual brains. I have a cute video. <laughs> uh, I just want to credit our Bilingual Parent Advisory Committee because they created this. Um, and this was part of um, a way where we got a lot of other committee members to truly understand what happens in a dual language program. So enjoy. Uno, dos, tres, cuatro, cinco, seis, siete, ocho, nueve, diez. The two-way program um, for the dual language in kindergarten is where we have both English speakers and Spanish speakers in the same class. I believe being in this um, multicultural classroom has helped to see themselves in a different light because there's other kids too who come from multicultural homes who have more than one language in their home. Our experience with the program has been really incredible, very welcoming from the first moment. The way we viewed it as, it's sort of like going to a private school. It might not be in your neighborhood, but um, you really just get involved. You know, do your research and certainly don't take the decision lightly, but also don't underestimate um, what those tiny brains can do, because it's pretty impressive. Hola, amiga. <laughs> <clears throat> I just want to again thank our curriculum coordinators and all the awesome work that they have um, been doing these past few years and then um, the beginning of this school year in the implementation of all of these great curricular um, resources and programs. Um, we have a few additional um, district committees that I'm just going to share really brief um, information about so that curriculum council will reconvene to support the implementation of um, curricular or strategic plan goal one. Um, we have our PBSST committee which is focusing on those district tenants of being responsible, respectful, and safe, um, and then creating some system-wide building structures to reinforce positive behavior across the buildings. Um, our differentiation and assessment committee um, has not met yet this year, but we will um, put something on the calendar to work um, on the goals um, driven by the District 58 strategic plan. And then um, as Justin um, made reference to in our strategic plan presentation, the district equity leadership team will also meet to review that um, equity journey continuum and work um, on those goals for the strategic plan. And that is the end of our evening and curricular workshop presentation. Any questions in terms of the committee work? Thank you. Thank you. Um, a comment and then a question. Uh, yeah. Uh, amazing work happening across the district and so just the wealth of content you were able to sum up in 29 minutes uh, <laughs> I know there's a lot of work that happens underneath it and so uh, kudos to the teams for uh, all the work that they're doing there uh, specific to the dual language program when we kicked off this pilot we started to think about this as how do we do this to see how it can work right and now we are in year two um, and uh, I'd love to get, one of the things that I remember when I filled out the survey as a parent uh, and when we saw the survey results across the district was, I'd love to do dual language as long as it's in my home school, <laughs> right? Like that's the, I'm, I'm not moving out of my neighborhood school, third rail in Downers Grove, we don't touch that. And this program uh, is uh, providing students with a very unique opportunity that um, I know a lot of parents would love to enjoy as well. And so, uh, this is this is me probably asking a question early in our pilot here uh, but asking the question nonetheless of where does this go for us as a district what, where if we see that this is a successful program and in in a handful of years we will have a student in all elementary grades uh in uh in a dual language classroom um, but interested to get a sense for where does this go what makes sense for a district that's shaped like our district is well, I'll give you first crack at it, and then uh, I'll go ahead. You know, I think um, we would like to continue to expand because we know that our program provides such a unique experience for our program, and it truly prepares our students for the world that we live in. So, 
Um, we want to expand up to, up to eighth grade. Um, right now, we're, we are housed at El Sierra. Um, and believe it or not, we, we got a lot of um, students from this year, I shouldn't say a lot, a couple of students from the north side um, that were interested in our and currently in, in um, our program. But I see, I see it expanding up to eighth grade and um, just continuing to expand at El Sierra and then not at O'Neill. I think the challenge at replicating this um, across every single elementary school, I just don't believe you're ever going to have the numbers of native Spanish speakers to support that at each mm -hmm. elementary school. You know, as this becomes more popular, I, there are some comparisons, Karath, that I would share with our specialized programs. I think initially when we set up our specialized programs, there was a lot of hesitancy of parents to send their children to a satellite school, so to speak, because they wanted to be in their neighborhood school and they needed some time to see, you know, is this program successful? Can I, you know, um, come to terms with sending my child outside of the neighborhood school? I think first and foremost as a district, what we've come a long, long way in, in two years. I want to credit Justin, I want to credit Sandy, Liz, the entire team for, for what they're doing. I, you know, I've had the privilege of being in these classes and it, it, it's just amazing. I think the first big step for our district was establishing the program. The next step is looking at, can we replicate this up into all the different grades, right? And so that's the path that we're on right now. If we were to expand with and, and continue to grow in our native Spanish speakers, I think one of the things we would look to do is not dissimilar to what we've done with our specialized programs, is to then offer a satellite perhaps on the other side of town, right? Because that makes it a little easier too. But so much of it is going to depend on how many native Spanish speakers do we have that we can pair with native English speakers to make this a successful program. And we just don't have those kind of numbers across our school district to support that at every single school. Because in order to support it at every school and still stay in the budget, what you would have to do is you would basically, if you, if you had two sections, one would become the dual and one would become the, the monolingual. Um, but certainly as we're in year two, we're starting to see the popularity around this. And so no doors are closed in terms of what the future will look like. But our priority right now is the district is making sure that we can continue to scale this up to the next grade level, which we believe are well on, uh, on the path to doing. But certainly um, looking at our demographics of our students and seeing where those opportunities are to grow, so long as we can do that in the confines of our budget, um, it, because that's a reality as well, and, and you, would, you would need the numbers to offset an entire section. Um, that's why it's worked so well at, at El Sierra as, as well. But we are starting to see some interest from students, not just in the El Sierra attendance area, as Sandy alluded to, on even the north side of town. And so we do want to see where those opportunities exist. Um, but I don't think we'll be at a place where that's, this could be offered at every elementary school, at least not yet. Can I ask one question that I have a comment on that as well? Um, in terms of those students who have chosen to be in the dual language program and are not in the all Sierra attendance area, do they have the option for busing like other specialized programs students do? Or do they have to have their own transportation to get there? Um, families can choose to provide their own, uh, to bring their own children if they would like to, but we do offer transportation okay. for anyone that participates that is outside of the LCR boundaries. Wonderful, that's perfect. Um, I just wanted to also comment on Karat's question and, and Kevin's kind of comments on that in, as and I'm only going to speak from my own perspective here, but I think I would probably echo a lot of other families as someone who has a student who attends a specialized program outside of my neighborhood school. Um, it is a leap of faith in some ways. When my student was a kindergartner and they said, this is where we think is the best place for him, it's at Kingsley, and I was like, what? That's not my neighborhood school. My other kid already goes here. How is this going to work? This is scary. Um, but I think when you realize this is either what your student needs um, or what you truly value if you're a student, if you're a family who just would like their student to become bilingual, that's just an important value for you as a family or whatever, um, you kind of have to take that leap of faith and say, this is something that is important enough that it's worth that chance. And, for me anyway, I've had the luxury, and I will call it a luxury, to now have experience with four different schools in our district so far. Next year I'll add number five, which is the other middle <laughs> school. Um, and 
right. it has really taught me that every single school in our district has amazing unique strengths and the neighborhood school model is very conducive to everyone saying my school is the best <laughs> my school is the best no, how could any other school compare it's so great it's so wonderful and it's true they're all great and wonderful and i've learned that over the course of all these years of having students all over the district all over the district and i just think it is challenging but it's a leap of faith and i think it can be really worth it in providing your child with either what they really need in order to be successful and grow or what you just really value for them as a learner and so it's it's tough and it's hard but it can really pay off so thank you just my my point of view thank you for sure <clears throat> any other comments or questions all right thank you guys so much all right, that brings us to public comment. This is now an opportunity for members of the audience to share public comment with the board, and issues raised during public comment may be added to future agendas or addressed by administrative staff. As appropriate, just a reminder that criticism of individuals is not in order. Faith, do we have any cards over there? All right, no cards, but I, if anybody would like to make a public comment, you're welcome, okay. Well then, if not, we're gonna go ahead, and I just got a one announcement, the next regular board meeting is going to be on Monday, November 13th. It'll be here at 7, uh, right here at Village Hall at 7 p.m. Uh, and that wraps us up for the night. So is there a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second. All right, Melissa, please go roll. Member Harris. Aye. Member Olchick. Aye. Member Weiner. Aye. Member Joshi. Aye. Member Ellis. Oh, not here, sorry. <laughs> Member Hannes. Aye. And Member Hughes. Aye. Uh, the motion carried. The meeting is now adjourned at 8.39 p.m.